Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Joe Witten, co-founder of the firm of Witten & Proctor Fine Art Conservation. Witten has been a painting conservator in private practice in Houston since 1999, after having worked as a conservator in various roles with the Art Institute of Chicago, the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. She has generously agreed to share some of her insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Joe, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So it's unusual for us to be interviewing someone in, in private practice as opposed to a nonprofit leader of a 501c3, but you've worked for so many nonprofit organizations, and we did want to take a look at the field of conservation in a broader sense, cutting across a number of different institutions. Let's talk about the field first to, to set the stage. Um, let's talk about conservation and how you uh, initially became interested in, in, in this field to make your career. Well, conservation is a term that encompasses restoration and preservation. And it was, it's a modern term that was invented to set us apart from, from people who were restorers who maybe didn't have, you know, a, a sort of a comprehensive understanding of the artwork. Um, I became interested in the field after um, I studied art at the University of Texas. I got a painting degree and I wanted to be an artist my whole life. I thought I would be an artist. And, and the minute I graduated, I, I just started thinking, you know, how do you do this? How do you, how do you live as a painter? So um, I did a lot of other things that, um, a lot of jobs. And I finally learned about conservation um, several years after I got out of college. And uh, it, it just sounded like something that would um, encompass all my interests. How did you learn about conservation? Because there isn't a, uh, or at least particularly at that time, there were, there were not comprehensive uh, conservation courses of study. There was uh, no conservation and preservation degree. Yeah, most everyone heard about it by accident back then. How did you my, hear? Well, my father um, worked at the university um, and he taught library science. And he had to move his office because they were putting a conservation department into the building where he worked. And my father said, oh, you should do this. This would be great for you. And of course, because it was his idea, it was a terrible idea. <laughs> but after a few years, there was enough time that it, it could come around to being my idea again. And, um, and I started volunteering there. So you started off as a volunteer, having, having um, taken a course of study as, as a studio artist. Mm -hmm. Um, and you got to the point where you were trying to exercise your skill. When you started off, did you have the idea of being a conservator, or, or, or were you more interested in uh, stitching together a, a, a living uh, well, while you were pursuing your, your painting? No, I was looking for a path, but I didn't know how to go about it. So I started volunteering, and I was very fortunate that um, someone took me under their wing, a, a woman who was a very fine conservator, and she said, if you want to do this, you need to start taking chemistry you're going to have to have a lot of organic chemistry. And, um, and so I did that. And because I worked for the university, they let me take chemistry during the day. And I took the labs at night. And I took five semesters of different kinds of chemistry. I'd never had any. And, um, and, and to get into school, you have to have a certain um, number of credit hours of studio art, art history, um, chemistry, and then some practical conservation experience. So through my volunteer work, I was getting the practical experience. And very shortly, they hired me as a technician. So I was only a volunteer for a short time. Um, and I, you know, I was going to have a double major, so I had extra art history credits. So all I had to do was take the chemistry. And, and your majors and were? Um, I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts in painting. So it seems that your initiation to this field really occurred almost as a form of apprenticeship, as opposed to undertaking a course of study. Somebody, you meet somebody, they take you under their wing, they introduce you to the field, and then you start your own course of study, which includes organic chemistry and, and other skills uh, that, that you start to acquire along the way. Well, I basically put together all those courses because I wanted to go to graduate school in conservation. That's what my mentor you know, suggested I do right off the bat. So everything I did after I met her was to get into a conservation graduate program. And there certainly is a history of people going through an apprentice program, but it's gotten to where sort of the credential, the only credential we have is a master's degree in conservation because we don't have licensing or certification. So, um, so that's what I did. I took all these courses and then I applied to graduate school. So there's no licensing or certification that would, um, that would certify in, 
your, your knowledge, your qualifications, your, uh, your experience. There's no re renewal of, of, uh, of certain techniques or, or ensuring that you remain on the cutting edge? Well, um, if you want to remain kind of vital in our field, there are a lot of things that you do just so you are vital, so you, you keep up. And we have a very active professional organization, the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. Mm -hmm. And we meet annually, and, um, and the, the, it's called the AIC. They've worked just incredibly hard over the past probably five to seven years getting grants for continuing education. So they offer workshops, you know, throughout the year in all the different disciplines of conservation. And that's a wonderful way to keep up. Our profession changes really rapidly. The technology changes, the, the, even the ethics change in our field. And that's why it's so important to, you know, for us to get together and share information and talk about things. And we do this mostly through that annual meeting. So the AIC also functions as a knowledge clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, um, we have in the in the organization we have several different levels of membership and you have to you know to be you're an associate, um, you're a professional associate which means you've you know fulfilled a certain level of experience and then you're a fellow after you've been in the field for a number of years and you apply. You have people support you in your application but um, that's not really a qualification. Yes. Because people can make it through that those steps and not necessarily be an expert at what they do, um, but but most people that you know this is the process where most people um, you know have some kind of credential and peer group and we watch out for each other. Now, once you um, you graduated in this field, um, did you at that point uh, join the Art Institute of Chicago? I went to graduate school for two years. Um, it's a three-year program at, at the school that I went to. Um, you do academics for two years, you do a summer internship each summer, mm -hmm. and then you do a third year internship, which is usually in an institution. It can be in a private practice laboratory. Um, and I went to the Art Institute of Chicago to fulfill that, and I was fortunate that they had a Mellon Fellowship, and I continued three years as a Mellon Fellow, which is a wonderful thing where you, you get to do research and you have a travel stipend, and um, it's a wonderful opportunity you know, for postgraduate work. And how did you get to the Getty? When I was working at the Art Institute, a, it's kind of convoluted, but a scientist from the National Gallery came to visit and asked my boss. We were, we were trying out some new materials that I learned about in graduate school. Materials meaning what? Well, it was varnishes in this case. Okay. And so museums rely a lot on the students that come from graduate programs to hear about new things because you learn the new stuff in the graduate program. So I knew about these varnishes, and I'd been testing them out, and this scientist from the National Gallery came, yeah. And he asked my boss if he wanted to go with him to teach a workshop in Spain. And my boss, bless his heart, said, well, Jill's your man. She's the one who's been working with these varnishes. So I went with this scientist to Spain, and, and that was in 93. Um, and we've been teaching in Europe and the US ever since about picture varnishes and these retouching paints that we ultimately developed. I went to the Getty on a Crest Fellowship to, to work on developing these retouching paints. Now, is the chemistry of those, um, uh, of those substances uh, similar to or even identical to the original uh, varnishes and paints? And, and talk about those differences and, and why those differences are so important. A very important concept in conservation is that everything be stable, reversible, and detectable. So our materials are very different from the original. On an oil painting, we do our retouching with um, pigments ground in different resins that have different solubilities and solvents. And you design a treatment with, with materials that essentially you can unpack from the top down. So the varnish is different from the retouching, which is different from the filling. I, I work on paintings, so I'm describing yes. the layering of a, of a painting restoration. Um, so we use very different materials. They have to be detectable in ultraviolet light or with a microscope or with, um, you know, some method. So we, you know, anyone who buys the painting or examines it later can tell which parts are in perfect condition and which parts have been restored. And reversible so that you don't inadvertently damage the original work. 
Well, reversible for that reason and because everything is going to age the way it ages as it goes along. And it used to be that oil paintings got retouched with, with oil paint. And the new retouching would age very differently from the old retouching and the colors wouldn't match. Right. Then they got the idea of adding some resin in with the oil paint or draining out the oil. And, and that works okay, but you still have oil in there. And oil right. just becomes very tenacious. It, it oxidizes with the air and becomes very sturdy. That's why we have oil paintings that are four and 500 years old. It used to be they used natural materials because that's all they had. Right. So when acrylics were developed, we started using acrylics. Can, may I talk a little bit more about this? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think starting in the 30s to the 50s, there was a lot of use of polymer varnishes, which are big molecules. And um, the idea for a little while was that you would restore a painting and it would never need to be restored again. And um, what we've learned over time, this is one of the changes in the field pretty much since I've been in it, is that it's far better to confine your restoration just to the areas of damage knowing that someone else is going to come back and revisit this this artwork, this cultural property at some time in the future. And the, the materials that we have now, I think, are aesthetically um, the best we've ever had. I mean, every generation, the materials we have are more re reversible and more beautiful and, and less noticeable when you put them on the artwork. Now, there is a significant amount of documentation that you prepare while you are actually um, undertaking your conservation. Talk about that, um, that documentation that you receive, mm -hmm. which may not be all that great, and that you leave once you are completing uh, work. Well, yeah, this is a very another, another really important thing in our field. We photograph everything that we work on, and we like to photograph the front and the back in the frame and then outside the frame so we can see the edges. Okay. Um, and then I'll talk about another, a, a number of other types of photographs we take. We write about the artwork. Always before you do a treatment, you write a description and a condition summary or, or very detailed condition report describing everything you see. And then you write a proposal of what you're going to do and a little bit of information about the materials. Um, sometimes the as you learn more about the piece as you're working on it, that the materials can, can change. But at the end, we take after treatment photographs. We write a report of everything we, we did and used. And it's good to describe you know, how the painting looked or the piece looked when you're finished. So when someone looks at it a long time later, they can see if it's changed from the way you left it. And then um, the, the work, particularly in certain works, is not just confined to the canvas itself in, in, in certain works, the, the frame is also a, a very important part of, of the work itself, particularly if the frame was, um, was matched to the work at the, at, at the time uh, that it was created. Uh, do you also work on the frame uh, piece or do you work in partnership with others in conserving that part of the work? Well, we encounter a lot of complex materials where we work in partnership with other people. Um, we have developed our skills to work on frames. If something needs to be completely regilded, we work with a furniture or a frame conservator. But um, we have very good techniques for doing small re repairs on frames, and we really encourage clients and owners to keep any of the original materials. You know, anything that sort of describes the hand of the artist or the context of the time is important to keep with the with the work, even the stretcher that the painting stretched on the canvas. Oh, really? Those used to be routinely discarded, and they are just full of information, historical information about when the painting was made, the, the financial circumstances of the artist in a lot of cases. I mean, there's just a ton of information in the tax mm -hmm. that are used, and sometimes there are brush cleanings on the stretcher or inscriptions, and all that is very an important part of the historical record. Now, certain works in particular are, co are constantly being transported from one institution to another, and there will be a curator who has uh, primary responsibility for that work, and then there will be curators who receive the work and then pass the work on to uh, the next organization. Um, do you work with, with the curators, and, and how do you work with the curators? We do work with curators. Um, a curator's role, it's, it's nice to be in a collaboration with someone when you do a painting treatment 
which is what a restoration is called. And in some cases, that's that's an owner. In some cases, it's a curator. Right. And um, in a curator's case, they often know a lot about the artist and the way the artist worked. Um, they may know a history of whether the artist varnished the, their paintings. Although you can't uniformly say this artist never varnished a painting, it's it's instructive to know that you know in their early work they varnished and then they didn't because we really like to respect a varnish changes a painting and we like to know what the artist's intent was. That was a very important thing and if we can help establish that by working with a curator, we do. And sometimes you work with a living artist, uh, you know. Uh, how has this work changed since you made it? And that's a very important relationship, too. Is your sensibility to always uh, bring back a, a classic work to uh, as the artist would have rendered it and as people would have, would have viewed it, particularly when it comes to varnishes? Those are important decisions. Yes, and it's interesting with varnishes because um, with all the information we have, it's still um, fairly sub subjective and um, somewhat subject to the, the aesthetics of our time. Because if you really look at historic varnishes, which, which we have a lot, they were made with um, resins that were boiled with oil. Um, they pretty much had to be thick because they didn't have anything to thin it with. And they darkened And they would have often. been very, very glossy. And now that we have artificial lights in museums, you know, we don't go for thick. Right. Thick varnishes and um, really glossy varnishes usually, but um, we do try to saturate the colors to the level that that artist might have done. So those early varnishes, um, saturation has to do with the depth of the color, the um, contrast of the colors, and so we have a number of resins now that we can use that are stable and reversible, but we can get different surfaces and different levels of saturation with these materials. And, and that's one thing that I teach about when I teach workshops is, you know, a lot of people get trained using one thing and, they're, and they have amazing skill with getting a certain variety with this one resin. And it takes, you know, a pretty remarkable person to be able to introduce new techniques as a mature conservator. But that's, that's what people do. They, they come to these workshops that we teach and, and we teach them, you know, give them a variety of tools. So they essentially have more tools in their toolbox when they're done. Do you get involved at all in deconstructing works and, and looking at what's, ha what's happening underneath the paint? It's a really important collaboration, um, the, the curator and conservator collaboration, because a lot of the research that gets done in our field is not um, necessarily to inform the restoration. It's to learn about the artist's techniques, and you study you know, a body of work, and you, you look at the canvas, you count the threads, you, um, you analyze the paint, you, you look at the, the priming layer. There are so many sophisticated techniques now for, you know, looking at, at every layer of a painting in a non-destructive way. Being able to, destructive would be a cross-section where you take right. a tiny little pepper grain, but it shows you all the stratigraphy. And sometimes that's an important thing to do. But, you know, there are a few institutions that have the ability now to, to detect what all the pigments are without taking any samples, and it's, it's quite wonderful. Now, as an independent conservator, walk us through what a small, small institution or a collector would, would do and how, and how that would work. Well, it's really interesting because um, sort of the, the big brothers of the profession, the, the Getty and the National Gallery, the institutions that are well-funded and have this equipment, have conservation scientists, um, will collaborate with smaller institutions, European institutions, if there's a work that they want to use in a show and the institution has one of the pieces and the other two are in other parts of the world, they'll bring those pieces all together and usually have an exhibit that might travel to the other two institutions. I mean, it's a very beneficial relationship because everyone gets to study these pieces together. Yeah. So, so the, the, the exhibition collaboration is more than an exhibition. It's more than what the public sees. It's also a research collaboration. Oh, yeah. It's a conservation uh, collaboration. And, and by putting together these deals, what is actually taking place, it's, it's advancing knowledge, but also exhibiting that knowledge to the public. That's right. Yeah, it's a very rich relationship. 
Um, and you know, often a, a beautiful catalog will come out of it with with all those different aspects, you know, highlighted a scientific section and and you know all the art historical information. It's you know there have been altars that were cut up, and you know every few years they'll find another piece in the market of an altar, and you know they'll digitally recreate it, and and sometimes you know they they put together these very elaborate altars, and there's just one little piece that they haven't found yet. It's you know investigative work. So, so let's say these these pieces all come together, maybe under the auspices of a, a of a Getty sponsorship, and then they come to they come together. What happens next as as you're thinking about the the conservation practice? These pieces sometimes come together and they don't get restored, but um, I know that the Getty has had a program where they. Um, bring in a conservator from somewhere else and even a body of work of an artist and they'll work on it at the Getty. And so everyone learns through that process. I mean, the Getty gets to be in these close contacts or whatever institution gets to be in close contact with these works that they haven't really studied before. And the conservator has the benefit of all the, the beautiful facilities and the and the expertise of the other conservators. It's, it's a great relationship. Um, so sometimes things come for restoration. Sometimes they just come for study. Are there different styles of conservation that different organizations apply or different um, challenges that you face when you deal with large versus small organizations, uh, organizations that are more educationally oriented, uh, organizations that are more focused on connoisseurs? How, how does that interaction occur with the client and what kind of challenges do you face in that area? I think most of the fundamental research that's done is done in institutions. You know, the, ins the, the stuff that teaches us about the, the materiality of the art and the, um, the context of the art. Um, in private practice, more of the, the analysis and research that's done is, is done towards the idea of knowing the best way to restore this piece of art. And often you do learn something, you know, key in your analysis. Um, you know, just uh, over the years, the, the philosophy of our work has changed a great deal. Even the 20 years I've been in the profession, um, a lot of techniques have gone out of fashion. I mean, things we've considered too heavy-handed and, you know, wax infusion of paintings used to be very common. Throwing out the stretchers was very common. And, and now um, we just, most, of, most people, are very conservative in what they do to the artwork. I mean, there's certainly um, people out there doing all the old techniques too, but um, but the field has really in changed in terms of, of what we do to the art and and sort of just the finished product. It just gets better and better. It's, very, it's, it's heartening. <laughs> it gets better all the time. Yeah. Well, Jill, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and for joining us today. Well, thank you. <laughs>